Uh, hello, everybody. I think we can get started. My name is Yid. I work in the Android framework team, and I'm also the TL for architecture components. Today, I want to talk about like how we end up making a project like this. What was the reason? And I also want to give some background information about some decisions we made while designing these components. Some of these things may not be very straightforward, so I wanted to give some insights to you. Oops, why did this go back? OK, so this, our starting point was this phrase, Android development is hard. If you ask people, engineers, whether they're Android developers or not, they will tell you this. And as anything in the world, it actually comes up with some good and bad things. So let's look at them. So there is actually, this actually has some advantages, right? First of all, you have very good job security. Right? If you're like a decent Android developer, there's no way someone is firing you because it's very hard to replace you, which also comes up with a very good pay, right? You're getting paid very well because you're doing something hard. So this is great for all of us, but it also comes up with some disadvantages, like things like, well, the quality of applications on the platform are not that good because if the developer doesn't really know all the ins and outs, they're not going to write decent applications, which means it's bad for people, it's bad for the users because their applications are crashing all the time. The other part of this is the higher entry barrier. Now, like, imagine yourselves when you were, I know when you started developing, I started when I was in high school and the, like the, Easiest thing to start is web development, right? Like people, and if Android development is so hard, no one will start with it, which is really bad for the platform, right? People should be able to easily write Android applications. I'm not saying that they should write the best application, but writing a simple application should be much easier than this. So around the last August, almost a year ago, we met with CAP members. CAP stands for a Customer Advisory Board. It's a group of external developers where we discuss the future of Android. And we ask them, okay, what's hard with Android? We think it's very easy working in the framework. Like, everything is so straightforward. <laughs> and like, they came up with this whole this, uh, list of things. Like, it's a, such a sad meeting. Like, all these complaints after complaints after complaints. I'm like, this is so sad. <laughs> so sad. But, like, it is the reality, right? And we are talking to people, like, they're really, really good developers. Like people working like Square, Uber, like American Express. There's like decent developers that you see in these conferences and they think these things are hard, which is bad for us. But they're only like just a group of small developers. We also went and talked to like teach people who teach Android, like contractors or agencies. Like we talked to different people from different groups and asked them what is hard about Android. And there was a similar list. This is actually a shorter list. They complained less, surprisingly. Uh, but like similar things like Android life cycles are hard, like persistence has, prototyping is hard. And like something that came from the Udacity document was like threads are hard. Like threads, if you think, is, is very fundamental in computer science. But if you look at it more practical, let's say you're doing backend development, right? Or even on the front end JavaScript, you don't deal with threads. They just don't. They exist, but you don't really know about them. You don't care about them. Versus on Android development, is always that you need to know about them. So like, since some things we can fix, some things we cannot fix. But one of, in one of these interviews, there was a very memorable quote. This person said, I don't want to deal with technical things. Like, I'm like, what? <laughs> you are an engineer, and then you don't want to deal with technical things. But like, this person had a very good point. He said, I just want to deliver the product. He's trying to build a business, right? He just wants to finish these things and like, go on to the next client. He just wants to deliver something that works. Like, he doesn't, he's not like here in these conferences, we can just talk all day about like, the best, perfect, whatever testable architecture. But at the end of the day, there's this guy that he just wants to deliver a product. And these people are actually the majority of the platform. Like these are the people that are writing most of the applications, so they need to be served well. So like after all these depressing meetings, we when we started working, we we're like, okay, like we need to figure out what to do. And like how are we going to approach these problems? We know these problems need to be solved and we need to start somewhere. So we came up with some like uh, anchor points for us, some rules, you may say. 
Uh, we said first we're going to focus on the fundamentals. So like Android by itself is, is actually very consistent as an operating system, but anything right above is, is actually quite diverse. You, you have no idea what you want to do. So we said, okay, we're gonna make it easier. So when you're starting to write an application, it should be much easier. The fundamental things should be there. And play well with others. This is very important because like, Android has more than 10 years of history. There's lots of libraries, guides around there, there's lessons. Whatever we create, we cannot just like ignore all of them and start from scratch. Whatever we do needs to work well with existing solutions. The other part is we need to be opinionated. So like part of Android for operating system, like as an operating system, it has a very strong idea of how an application should run. But once you're inside the application, which most of you write, we say we have no opinion, you just do whatever you want, which doesn't work. But if you want to provide higher level solutions, you actually need to be a little bit more opinionated. So say, so okay, we will be. Skill is another important thing, but the whatever solutions we provide, it should help you get started easily. But then as your applications grow, they should be able to stay in your code. It shouldn't be something you throw out. Like a great example of this is something like preference activity, right? It's very easy to start it with. You just give the exam and it works. And then try to modify it. You'll just have to rewrite it. So what's the point of using that class now? So we don't want it to happen. Reach is another important point. So if you are working in the framework, whatever you do is just in the new version of Android OS which all we know is actually none of the devices on the public. So whatever we do needs to be backward compatible. We just cannot change how Android works and call it a day. And last but not least, we said we want to be pragmatic. So there's sometimes solutions that's like 100% correct, but is really hard to achieve. And there's this other solution, which is like 90% correct, which is much easier to achieve. So like sometimes we need to go that way to make things easier for people. So if you go back to our original question, Android the one with this heart, is a statement. Uh, we said we're going to focus on some things. Like these are the first things we are picking. We said you need to embrace these life cycles. Like life cycles aren't there, they're not going to go away, but we can make them easier. Second one is we said we're going to have a better persistence layer. It's like it's possible, but it's really hard, and there's these like 25 other libraries trying to solve this problem. When you begin Android development, the out-of-the-box solution needs to be much better. And we need to provide some architectural guidance. That this is a problem we have ignored. Like, luckily, we have a great community, so people are solving this problem. But again, if you are new to the platform, it's very hard to understand which one is better. And people have been asking us, what does Google think? What does Google think? So like, we need to answer this question. And there's actually, so I had this four in my slides. This, we actually had one more project. I mean, we still have it, but we couldn't finish it by I.O. So I, I'm keeping it here because I want to let you know that there's like a lot of work going on here and more stuff is about to come. Anyway, so let's start with embracing the life cycles. Uh, when looking at this problem, we are looking like where do the developers start development? Like how do you start development? And if you, Look at the most of the, like, the college graduates or like high school people. They usually start with web development because it's very easy. You just create a file, change the extension to the HTML, and it works. <clears throat> so we did some comparisons. If you look at web development, like and you're writing this hello world, it's super easy in web development. It is acceptably easy in Android, assuming that you download Android Studio, it downloads like another 200 gigabytes, and now you hit run. <laughs> But it is easy, you're just like hitting around, you know, like you don't need to understand anything. If you want to like fetch some data and show it on the UI, now in web development it's still super easy. In Android development it's like relatively easy, but it's a little bit tricky because it's where life cycles come to play. If you're trying to write complex applications, uh, on web it's, it's hard, like people are developing frameworks. On Android it's also very hard and it's also very tricky and if you, see these companies with bigger applications, they have giant engineering teams. These teams are much bigger than the people writing the Android framework. So let's look at a more concrete example where you're fetching some data and displaying on the UI. I'm not saying this is how you should do it, but this is how you do it when you start. You just like spin off an Ajax request on the web, and when the response comes, you put it on your div, and you're good to go. 
You can write the same code on Android, right? You just like when user does something, the click happens, you call your API, you fetch the data, and then you set it on the view, which is almost as easy as the web. But the careful listeners will notice this is actually wrong. This code is not handling the lifecycle, right? This code is broken. The, the very most intuitive thing you would write doesn't work properly. If you want to make it work, you will need to like keep a reference to the response somewhere, uh, manage that reference, like null it out when you are done with it, or when the activity is stopped, you need to cancel it manually. <coughs> All this work you need to do to make the simplest example do the right thing. And this is also what we call boilerplate code. Now, Android is kind of infamous for having this boilerplate code, and this is part of it. So like, you know what? We need to fix this. So part of this is focusing on the fundamentals. Like the life cycle is a very fundamental thing. It's going to be there, so it should be easier. And we're like, okay, we need to acknowledge this. So we need to embrace life cycles, make it a thing that people can refer to. So I, how do you start when you, the first thing you think is, okay, just make the life cycles observable so that people doesn't need to override these methods. They can instead observe them in a more clean way. And, but we wanted to figure out some sort of automatic lifecycle handling. Like, part of these things are just dummy code, so it should be able to be, we should be able to automate it, right? We are engineers, that's what we like to do. So we started the very first prototype, we came up with this, okay, like all these methods we have, just turn them into states. Because you would think that every time an activity or fragment receives one of these messages, it's actually moving to another state. But the reality is a little bit different. This is actually how the states are. These things are not states, they're your events. And the states are the things each time your activity or fragment moves when it goes through things. It looks like this mountain where you go up and down as you move between these states. But we weren't sure because, so if you look at like the fragment source code or activity major source code, these are the states. But developers don't really know them because there was no class called state before. Uh, we were talking to uh, Big Nerd Ranch, like showing them these components, and we asked them, because they teach students, we asked them, like, does your students understand the difference between events and states, or should we just go with the most uh, straightforward thing? They were like, no, 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 we teach them. They can easily understand these are like states are the nodes, and the events are edges between them. So like, cool, so we were able to verify this uh, assumption, and we said, okay, these are your states. And when, once we have these states, it makes it much easier to explain. If you are resumed, user is focused in your activity or fragment. If you are st started, you're visible, but you don't have the focus. And everything else, you're created, initialized, you're just not there. If you are destroyed, you're gone. Like, hopefully, you're not coming back. <laughs> But this is so much easier to understand than like thinking, oh, I received this event, where am I now? What if I receive this other event? This makes it much simpler. We say other important thing is the reach. Whatever we do needs to be reachable to people. What do I mean by this? So if you want to make an activity observable, this is probably the code you would write. Well, activity just observe and do whatever you want. And we could have done this. We could just go ahead and change the activity source code. Luckily, we have that uh, capability. But this will mean that will only work in API 26 plus, pretty much none of the devices. So we know that wouldn't work. So we could give you this another base class, lifecycle owner, and ask you to extend it as well in your activities. Unfortunately, Java doesn't have multiple inheritance. We cannot do that either. So we say, okay, we can come up with this life cycle on the interface because that's how kind of Java mimics multiple inheritance. But then we will need to ask you to overwrite all these methods again and handle all this observer logic, which is just like, is not very practical, right? We couldn't ask you to do all of that. And so trying to, like, what are we trying to achieve here? We are trying to make it easy things easy. Like, an activity is already observable, you should be able to make your activity observable in the lifecycle world. Make hard things possible. Now, like there is, there is libraries like Conductor which don't use like fragments, that they should be able to hook into this system as well. So we need to solve both of these problems. So in terms of making things easy, 
We said, okay, we, we can just create this lifecycle activity for you. So if you only had a like super basic activity, you can start extending this one, it will take care of you. Which most of the time we know it doesn't work because you have already had these like other activities you want to extend from. Then we came up with this other thing, like this a new interface called lifecycle registry owner that extends the lifecycle owner interface. And if you implement that interface, keep a field yourself and give it back to us in this other method, we will take care of all of the events for you. This allows us to, like, this allows you to make any of your activities a lifecycle owner without writing too much code. And we just figure out everything else by using ex existing callbacks in the system. And I, I believe this is like this is an okay compromise because this means that this code works on API 14 plus. You can change any activity to be like this, uh, and it's just three lines of code. And then this this also gives us a hundred percent reach. But we also want to make hard things possible. This is part of the scaling problem. Like you should be able to be nice or play well with other libraries. So if you're writing a library like Conductor, whatever fragment replacement class you have, you can still implement lifecycle owner. And then you need to manually do all these things, but you probably do it in your base class that you provide in your library and you do it only once. Once you do that, everything that works with a lifecycle, every component you can find on the internet that works with a lifecycle, suddenly starts working with your library. And we said we want to be pragmatic while we are building these things. Like sometimes Ender, we just uh, don't really think about the real use cases and we make mistakes. <clears throat> so let's look at an example here. Let's say we have a listener that observes an activity and then there's the activity that also overwrote that method. Now you may ask like which one is called first? And if, if you think about like a normal observability, Usually when a component changes state, the component first changes the state, and then you call the observer saying that the components change state. If you look at this problem outside Android, that will be your answer, which was our answer initially. But then we realized that will be wrong. We should actually call the listener first. And the reason for this is, is a very practical example. If you had some code like this, where it listens for the activity to stop, and if it stops, it marks itself so that it doesn't call back the activity. Uh, this is the kind of listener you would write. And if you write this like this, and if we were calling your listener after the activity, you will get into these cases where your activity stops, but even after it is stopped, it starts doing something else, and then uh, everything breaks. So we said we'll be practical, and we came up with this slightly less intuitive uh, life cycle where for the events you are going upwards, we first let the activity or the fragment handle that event and then call the observer. So like activities on create finishes and then your lifecycle observer receives on create. Similarly, until on resume, it works that way. But if the activity is going through this direction, we actually call the listeners first because we know how those curves are usually written. They, they wanna do something with the activity. So if the activity is going to die, where they first tell the listener so it does the cleanup. So then if you're going downwards, first the listeners get called and then the activity goes. So it's part of like being pragmatic, looking at actual examples and deciding how these things should behave. So if you look at all this, like a first example where we started about fetching data, now we can just change the API to receive the lifecycle and be done with it. Like you sh I'm not saying you should write this code, but this is what you wrote when you started Android development, and it should work. So this is the goal. Now we, we can create APIs which receive lifecycle and then take care of it for you. So the other part of the problem was we need to have a better persistence story out of the box. Now, there is like, we provide SQLite, SQLite is great, but the APIs we provide around SQLite is just like out of boilerplate code, lots of constants everywhere, you need to build string SQLs yourself, it's just out of code. And the first discussion we were having was, okay, do we want to use an ORM or not? And we're actually like, part of these things, you can see like, we, we promote retrofit, we didn't go in and write a new 
uh, HTTP client. So we, we considered picking one of the existing ORMs and like make it, you know, endorse it, tell people to use it. But the first question was, do we actually want to use an ORM or not? And trying to answer that question, we were more like, okay, what, do, what are we trying to achieve here? We're just trying to close the gap between SQL and Java. It should be much easier to persist objects and pull them back. And while doing this, we didn't want something that's like a virus going all around your application. Like we don't want to enforce a base class. We don't want to enforce anything special. Like persistence should be something on the side working well with the rest of your application. It needs to be convenient. This is one of the problems. Like we don't want to create some solution where like you need to change some code, then compile it or generate some code, then you can use it to write some stuff. This, this is just not very convenient. We want it to be predictable. Like when you see some code using room, you should be able to just, okay, like I understand what this code does. We didn't want to hide the details of SQL or, or any other technology we potentially use. And want it to be fast. Now, uh, SQLite is already very fast. So uh, as long as we don't put too much boilerplate on top of it, we knew that it was going to be fast enough. And size matters for the database. So, we could have like tried to implement a new engine and stuff and like ask you to ship it with your app, which was like another five megabytes that everybody needs to ship. And this is important for us, like we don't want that. And if you look at like SQLite is on every single Android device, so it was kind of our obvious choice. It's a good technology, works very well, and is everywhere. So we don't need to ship an additional library for that. But then we're trying to decide, okay, like how does the API look? And we're looking at examples. Like one of the examples here is uh, like this thing. I created an object and I called save. And like how does it even know where to save itself? Like what happened to my app section? How does it know which database to talk? This is like, this is so hidden. This is not cool. If you try to test this code, you will have a very, very hard time. So we don't want to create this kind of solutions. But if you say, okay, if you go with the, like the bare bone SQLite solution, then you need to create this content values class, which a really weird API you are calling the second parameter you are passing is null. I have no idea why. And then you are passing the actual values. And like you are passing content values. I, I, I had this organization class. I want to work with that. I don't want to work with some like intermediate data representation. So this is just, like, it looks ugly. Or when I want to retrieve the data, when you use an ORM, they usually come up with a query builder. So you need to build this SQL using this Java that looks like SQL, but it doesn't really look like SQL. It ends up something like this. Like, this is like readable, but it's not that straightforward. And we don't like it. If you wanted to do the same thing in SQL, this is the query you would write. Like super simple, it's just one line. And then when we say, okay, let's use SQL then, and then you query a database, it returns your cursor. It doesn't return you an organization anymore. Now you lost, like, whenever you move one side, you lost the other thing. You move the other side, you lost this capability. It's like, it's not cool. So we wanted to, you know what, why don't we just take best of the board worse? We just let you write SQL because it's concise, it's like, for every single SQL or SQLite problem you will have, there's already an answer on Stack Overflow. That's like, this is such a big power. So we say, okay, we'll let you write SQL, but we will do the conversions for you. So we're going to kind of bind your SQL to Java. And that's how we come up with Room. And we're looking at more examples. So you like, this is how you do a join in like one of the ORM libraries. Like as soon as your query starts getting complex, your query builder code becomes really, really unreadable. If I do the same thing in SQL, it's so much easier, it's so much more understandable. Though we said, okay, fine, let them write that SQL, let them whatever SQL they want. So we let you write your SQL, but Room will understand. Uh, there was the initial thing when I said, like, we don't want to enforce any base class or anything. Room just wants to work with your class. So if you wrote a query and you created another class which matches what the query returns, we will do that work for you. There's nothing special about this class besides those annotations, you don't count them. And then room just works. And this is literally what we wanted. So we, we started writing a design doc, did some prototypes, like see how it will look. 
And in, in February, we had another CAP meeting. Yeah, like CAP stands for this customer advisory board, where we ask developers, what do you think about this? So we ask them, OK, like we show them room, and we ask them, what do you think about this? And we give them a voting sheet. There's all these like, features we are planning to implement, and we ask them, should we implement it or not? And every attendee gets these green and red uh, votes. So they can put a green vote on something, saying that, yes, I want this. Or they can put a red vote. You're like, this is not very important. And they need to spend these votes, because we don't have unlimited resources. So one of the questions we ask, like, should we do the compile time query verification for you? So when you write that query, is it important that we verify it? And like everybody said yes. This was a, like a big, uh, we had like significant concerns when we were going with SQL. We're like some people don't like SQL, they don't want to learn SQL, we had all these concerns. Uh, turns out like they're okay to learn SQL. The problem is how you use it is horribly broken on Android. Uh, so we said, okay, we're gonna fix this. Uh, another thing we asked was migration support. I personally believe that no one cares about migrations. I was super wrong. Uh, <laughs> so I was horrible. This is why we asked. So you, you cannot always see this. So we said, no, you need to come up with a good migration solution, which we came up with a solution. I don't know if it's good or not, but we did. Uh, the other thing I expected, like, should we provide the Query Builder API? Because there's so many people loving them. And it was no. This was, this was another like, very surprising moment. I'm like, why do you guys don't want this? Because everybody else is doing it. Uh, more on that later. Uh, there was this other more, like, more obvious question. Like, do you want SQLite to understand? Uh, do you want Android Studio to understand SQLite? People were like, yes, please. So like, fine. Uh, and that was one more thing we asked. Like, do you want us to support relationships? And they said yes, and more on that later. So I say like we come up with these ideas, we have some information on our mind, and we ask people what do they think we should do. We kind of merge it, what we think we should do, and try to come up with a solution. So in terms of the question of query builder, because we were surprised, we asked them why. Like, what is wrong with query builders? <laughs> we think people love them. And when they said no, this was the explanation they gave. If you're writing a simple query, it's actually already very easy to write with SQL. Like you don't need a builder to help you. You don't even need con completion to help you. If you're trying to write a complex query, the query already gets, like with a builder, it already gets very unreadable. There's just no added benefit of doing that. Is that if you let me write SQL and just, just verify it at compile time and make Android Studio help me write that query, then you already solve my problem. I don't need a builder on top of it. We're like, cool, uh, we will do that. Uh, but there was this other part with relations where people say we should solve this problem. Now we got more, we kind of stick with our hinge, and I want to explain why. So room comes with no relation support, relationship support, and there's this specific reason for this. So if you have a class like this where you have a feed object, and then the feed is a user, and the feed was probably published by a user, so that intuitive Java model says, well, the feed has a user field. Once you do this with Room, Room says, no, 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 I'm not going to let you add a user inside this feed because I have no idea how to persist it. Which means you cannot contain an entity inside another entity in Room. But I want to explain this why. So let's say you write a query like this. Like I'm selecting some feeds. And it's unpredictable. When I fetch that feed object, am I fetching the user or not? Now, if you look at the feed class that has a user, so you would expect it to fetch that user as well. But then most of the time, you're just doing unnecessary deeds from the database. So that's a tough problem. And if you look at the existing solutions, most of them just say, you know what, we well, just do lazy loading. That's an easy solution. Unless you access the field, we don't fetch it. So it's really in. Uh, well, like, fine. Uh, how do you implement it? Usually, you implement it something like this, where you have like a private fields. The first time get user is called, you go and like fetch it from the database, and the, the follow-up query is just return from the cache. Now this looks good, but it actually is not. This is like a mine planted in your code base. Uh, let's look at like a, we have a recycle view like this, and you, were, you had this feed, you were showing the title and the subtitle, everything looked fine, like three months later your product manager comes, you know what, let's put the author's name into the feed. And the developer goes, oh, so easy. The feed has this get user. I'll just call it and put the username. I'm done. 
I look at it, it looks like it's working, it's fast enough, we're very really cool, but it's actually not. You just made a database query on the main thread. And like, I wanna make this clear, there's no such thing as, my query is so fast, I can do it on the main thread. That just doesn't exist. <laughs> there's no such world. Like, you don't control. Like, it, and it's very easy for you to reproduce. Just like, get your application, like go to Play Store, tell it to update all, and try using other applications. You will see how much slower your application becomes or like any application on your device, because this flash disk on these devices are not that fast. So you just cannot risk it. Plus, like, on the main thread, you have 16 milliseconds, which in practice, you have more like eight milliseconds, and then there's the render thread. So even if your query takes like two milliseconds, this is 25% of your time. If you have a recycler, you have four of those, you already spent all the time and you just lag. So we don't wanna provide a solution like this. Instead, we wanted to embrace how SQLite does this or any uh, relational databases does this. You can join different columns. So we said, you know what, just keep the user as a user ID in there and write a query that fetches what you want. So when you write the query, say, I want title, subtitle, and the username. Next time your product manager comes and says, I want this additional field as well, just update your query and fetch it. But we made sure Room works nice in these use cases. So when you said, like, I want to return an item, what is this item? It's just like any data class. There's no annotations, nothing here. It's just your regular pojo, and Room can work with it. And once you do this, because we know what the query is, we can even do things like this. We know when the query would be invalidated, you can just return a live data. So by writing the right query, by incentivizing you to write the query, you decrease the bandwidth you use with the I.O., is much more efficient and you don't risk anything on the main thread. So this was like one of the examples where we listen to CAP but we don't listen to them all the time. Uh, so we say use POJOs for relationships, right? There's no hidden cost, everything is straightforward, it's predictable, you know what you're fetching and it's still observable, which is like a big property of room. So we said we needed to be opinionated while writing these components. And while writing Room, we decided like SQLite is the way to go. It's a, it's a proven industry standard, it's everywhere. Like if you learn SQL or SQLite, that's actually a very good thing for you in your career, even if you move to like backend development uh, next year. It's on every single device. We said we are just not going to allow main thread queries because there's all this case like I do it or it's fast, and then we are fine. Like no, it's not okay. See, there's this funny story, like we have this, architectural samples, I think, I'm not sure Florina hate me for saying this, but like, when we were moving them to room, we just moved them and started crashing because we were making main thread queries there as well, because you just don't realize while writing this. So the tool, the library you are using needs to help you with this. If we were shipping it as a real app, we would probably receive some ANRs. And we said no relations. I mean, we have a solution, like we, we support joins properly and we have some uh, follow-up tasks about it, but we are not going to have these like, hidden relations in your entities. Now, last but not least, we said you need to be writing a data access object. So it's part of Room's API. This how you, it's kind of a best practice of using the database, so we want to incentivize it. And we also said we want to play nice with others. So what does that mean? We said there is no base clauses. Like if you if you force it to use some base class, we could actually provide some nicer APIs and stuff. We're like, no, they're not worth the cost. You, sh you should be able to just take out room, and your application should still like somewhat be able to work. And it helps a great deal with testing. Uh, or things like RxJava support. Like we know a lot of people are using RxJava. They love it. It's fairly complex, so. The guy who doesn't want to deal with technical things, he will never learn RxJava. So we, we cannot enforce everybody to use it, but I mean, it should work and we will support if you are using it, Room will just play nice with RxJava. Okay, uh, the third topic we have is the architecture. So you, most of you know this famous post from Diane and she said, you know what, we have no idea about architecture, which she is right. Uh, most people were surprised, some people were angry, uh, so I wanted to go deep in this a little bit. 
It's like, why do we, like people who write Android has no idea how you should be writing your Android application. It's kind of weird. But the reality is this. We are writing an operating system that we are writing things like activities, services, how these things talk with each other, how do we preserve battery. Like, there's a whole operating system problems. We have strong opinions. And then we provide fairly consistent APIs back to your application from there. But that's all we do. Putting them together, that's not what we do. We don't write applications as a part of our daily work. So we don't necessarily know. I mean, we know how these things work. But like, unless you are doing it full time, you don't really know all the gotchas that you will face if you're trying to put these components together. So as a result, today, this is the kind of Android development we have. Like, there's a lot of good libraries inside the Android framework or outside in the public that helps you do things very easily. Like if you want to fetch data, you just use Retrofit. It's a super nice API. Or if you want to show a list of things, just use Recycle View. Like it's very, very easy to do. These components are like very nice, very scalable. But if you want to put them together, like you want to write something that fetches a list of something that you can modify offline and then sync to the backend, that's a very, very hard problem. And then we don't provide anything here. And they're just like not cool. So that's why the community came up with all these like lots of more popular architecture talks. By the way, we have been like since 2010, we've been talking about how to architect your apps, but they're more in the scope of IO talks. Like then not, there was nothing if you go to developer Android.com. So when we started this task, we decided to do something here. The first question was, OK, what do we do? Do we pick something? Because people seem to like all these like, different architectural patterns. What happens if we just pick one of those things and tell people to use it? Uh, so if you look at that problem, there's some advantages of doing that. First of all, it's easier to explain. It's already like a well-established pattern. You tell people to use it. There's lots of documentation and resources about it. The other part of this is it removes the burden from the average job. Like the, someone who doesn't want to care, just give me the pill. I will take it. I will do it in my app. My app will work fine, and we'll just all be happy. So there's some advantages to doing that. But there's also some disadvantages. Like first of all, like there's no such like one perfect architecture that works everywhere the best case. It just, it just doesn't exist. Uh, which also goes against openness. Like the reason why we have such a nice Android community is that especially we made them suffer. The second part of it is like Android is so open. People love sharing. People embrace sharing. So we don't want to pick something that hinders the uh, development of other cooler things. And it's also hard to rationalize. Like if we said, you know, what well, I would just what if we say like tell people use MVVM and then someone comes, hey, but I have this super complex UI. I don't want to write it data driven. Like I, I want to choose MVP. That's so much better. I'm like, yeah, that's true. Like it depends on your case. So we cannot pick something. But to be honest, we couldn't agree. Like internally, there was this conflict of, well, if you go, if you take the pill, it will be so much easier to understand. But if we have uh, some pros and cons, you know, we just ask cab. So we ask people like, should we pick something and then go for it? And then people say, no. All we care is some guidance. Like, let people decide whichever architecture they want, but you need to provide some more, like, solid guidance, like something more than just saying don't run queries on the main thread or just use enums. Like just like something more concrete. So it's what we did. We tried to come up with an architecture. And then like around the time March, we had this code lab. Uh, this time we had like the prototype implementations for life cycles and room ready. So we created code labs. And we did presentations with this other Foo project. And then the architecture, like the recommended architecture we are planning to publish, we present them to these people. Well, who are these people? We invited developers all around the world. There's like Indonesia, South Africa, Italy, India. Like we literally invited developers from all around the world. And the reason why we are doing this is because like, I live in the Bay Area, or like anybody who lives in the United States, we kind of have this close circle of uh, different concerns. And if you talk to people from the rest of the world, their concerns are like someone from India, their concerns are much different, or like someone from Australia. So we wanted to get a better grasp of like, okay, what do people think they live in the other sides of the world? This is like a, such a nice like two days event where full day we work on these components, we discuss fiercely, and we try to improve these things. 
And one of these discussions was about architecture. So if you come look at the architectural recommendations, this is usually a graph. If you think like this is the axis from like writing a hello world app to a real world application, and the other axis is like how simple is your architecture and how complex, the graph usually looks like this. So when you start introducing an architecture, you get an immediate benefit, but then it's after some point is diminishing returns. You don't necessarily need those things unless your application is really complex. And our job was to find, okay, like when in this graph we stop, whatever we recommend needs to be somewhere here where it is still good for complex applications, but when you are getting started, it's also possible to start with them. And the initial architecture we came up with is this. Like we said, okay, we need to introduce this view model because people are writing God activities. We don't want that. So we tell people to use them. We have the live data, like everything sorted out. And let the view model handle these things. We will believe this will be much simpler to understand. And then in this code lab, people say, no, 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 no. If you do that, you just solved the God activity problem and you just created God view model problem. <laughs> I'm like, why? Uh, like, it's, it, okay, honestly, my first response is I'm so happy with a God view model compared to a God activity because at least it won't crash. Uh, but it's, it's ugly. So we, we debated a bunch more. We said, okay, like, it's worth introducing one more layer. That's how we came up. Like, we said, okay, now let's introduce repository as well so that people understand that they need to be providing some sort of API within their application to the rest of their application. So there was a lot of work writing these things and like documenting, and then we did a bunch of back and forth with these people. And then around April, we started this early access program. We just created these previews of libraries and then sent it to like initially eight people, then it became like 25. There were some companies in it. Just give these components to them. Uh, we had sample applications and stuff. We asked them what they think. This helped us iterate over the API. Like if, if you've seen those versions, you might have hated the library, I don't know. <laughs> we had to fix a bunch of problems. It's sometimes very hard to understand, and when, they, when people try to integrate it with their applications, they see the shortcomings, and it helps us uh, fix a bunch of those problems before things became public. And then around May, we had our API review, which is like a console that looks at every single new API. Uh, and there's another example of this, where we became really pragmatic. So initially, the API looked like this. Like all of these life cycles were in dev because we don't use enums because they took too much space, blah, blah. And the API console said that, you know, like, screw it. You're trying to optimize for usability. Just make it an enum. We are fine. Like sometimes it's fine to eat this, co this little cost in return for a greater benefit of making it a lot more understandable. So like these kind of choices were stuff that you will never see in the framework before. And we are making them. And this is all happening because we're trying to embrace the application development. We are trying to work with the community to decide how it should work. So by I.O., we, we finally had our Alpha 1 version out. Like, I was so happy. I was so scared. We had all these like, reactive communications on everything people will complain about. Turned out people liked it. So that was great. And by now, we have like Alpha 4 out this week. And I want to mention very briefly about what's next for, next for architecture components because I know many people are asking, okay, like, how long is it going to be an alpha? When are you going to ship it? So before we ship it, we have some iterations to do until 1.0. For example, in Room, we want to solve this lazy loading problem. Right now, Room doesn't have any API to allow you to lazy load data. It does return you a cursor, but there's nowhere enough. And Unfortunately, this is a very tricky problem. If you're one of those people who are just using a cursor adapter or using something that wraps a cursor, your code is already wrong. I'm really sorry about that. That's because of the cursor APIs. So we're providing this, we realize this problem and we are trying to work around it and provide something nice uh, inside the room. And hopefully other ORMs can just change their implementations as well. Uh, about life cycles, I mean, life cycles is a smaller API, but it's very tricky. Like, things like execution order is very important. We're still trying to finalize what those rules are. And last but not least, like, I'm spending, and many people in my team spending a significant uh, time just reading blog posts. Just like, I, I, I've never been on Reddit so much in my life. I'm just like <laughs> watching Android there, like, what people say about architecture components, reading all these things, and like, I sometimes comment, like, 
Sometimes people got something wrong, and then the next day at work we discuss, okay, why did they get this wrong? What are we doing wrong? Or maybe they had a critic that was right, and then we go back and try to figure out, okay, how do we solve this? Like, we are not going to solve all problems at once. We, we have started somewhere, and like we are doing these events where the feedback sessions, we bring like five, 10 developers who use architecture components into a room. We let them just like speak. What was wrong? What you didn't like? What you liked? And like we'll do these events like next week in London. We are doing many of these, just trying to understand what does the community think. This is like so different than everything else we have shipped so far, like things like support library. This is very new for us, but so far we believe it's working very well. We'll probably do more of this. And the reason why we are not calling these things 1.0 is that we want to feel comfortable to what we are committing. Like, if you are watching the project, you will realize that we are not really changing any APIs right now. Like things seems to be working fine, but like every day there are like more articles we are reading. Maybe we'll find some pitfalls that we want to address before 1.0. So that's what we are waiting for. So in terms of what's next, well, we want to ship that full. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't tell what it is, but it's cool. Uh, I just want to mention this because I want you to understand like this is just like this is just really really the beginning. So for that project we're actually running, maybe there's someone here who attended this code labs. We started showing the project to other people, getting feedback and like iterating over it. We are hoping to also like ship alpha one of that one while we ship the architecture components 1.0, but we don't know yet. And we actually started another project as well. <laughs> So it's, it's something that's like, for these projects, we start prototype, like imagine for life cycles and architecture, we started prototyping last year, like around October. So if you think about the timeline it takes to make these things to version one, or like an alpha one, it's a very long time. So we already like investigating, looking at options, prototyping, and we also think about, okay, in the next version of Android, which is P, what can we do that differently to make things more smooth? And like, it will be like this, like the creation company is a long-term effort. We just like really just started. And for us to be successful, we really need your feedback. Like we need people to look at these things, like write articles or just write me an email. I don't know, like harass me, I don't care. But like we need to get your opinions so that we can get this right. And I like try to think it in a way that there is that like developer who doesn't like to do technical things. That guy is an Android developer, too. he needs to be able to do his work. So everything we try to do, we try to make it scale to a wide uh, range of users. So when you see some decisions we've made, it looks like stupid or primitive, just try to think it again about this perspective. Where like, well, there's everybody else using it, not only me. And thank you. <laughs> <laughs>